I welcome you all to the book launch of 20th Century Indian Art, edited by Professor Partha Mittar, Parul Dave Mukherjee, and Rakhi Balram, published by Thames and Hudson, in association with Art Alive. Art Alive has been a pioneer in supporting the documentation, creation, and presentation of contemporary work in the field of arts. It has played a prolific role in archiving and documenting history of contemporary Indian art and has ventured into publications, including books, catalogs, and portfolios of artistic, literary, and educational nature. At Art Alive, we are committed to providing support for innovative projects that represent a convergence of discipline that challenges the audience with new ways of perception. Closely working with international publishers like Skira, Albin Michel, and Thames and Hudson, Art Alive has brought out notable publications like Shakti Burman, A Private Universe, Raza, A Life in Art, and Mandalas, among many others. 20th Century Indian Art is a major publication showcasing the history of Indian art across the subcontinent and South Asia from late 19th century to the present day. This essential, lavishly illustrated volume presents an engaging, informative history of art from the subcontinent as seen through the eyes of prominent Indian and international art historians. May I now request the film to be played? in order to understand modernist art in India, we need to appreciate its antecedents in colonial India, which wrought a momentous paradigm shift in artistic practices and institutions. Our passage through modernity was a complex process. It spanned the long 20th century, witnessing travel and communication revolutions political upheavals, world wars, revolutions, and genocides, all of which is reflected in the volume. For a number of years, I'd indeed been thinking of a comprehensive volume that would cover the art of the whole of the 20th century and its engagement with modernity. My section deals with three milestones on the roadmap of art produced in British rule. First, the transformation of pre-colonial art through institution, such as art school, genres, art, and the medium of oil painting. A new breed of gentleman artists and an art savvy, middle-class public came into existence, exemplified by the celebrated Raja Ravi Varma. Second milestone, the first nationalist art movement in Bengal that rejected Victorian art in favor of returning to pre-colonial Mughal, Rajasthani, and Pahari painting. Modernism was heralded by the exhibition of Paul Clay, Vasily Kandinsky, and the Bauhaus artists in Kolkata in 1922 an era dominated by pioneering modernists, Amrita Shergill, Robinath Tagore, and Jamini Roy. Their critical modernism was complemented by the nationalist institution Shantini Ketan, which married art with anti-colonial environmentalism. The colonial period segued into post-independence modernism. That story will be taken up by Parul and Rakhi. So section two, which I have edited, starts from 1947 and it 
kind of traces the dominance of the national modern and ends around the 1990s. It also touches upon decolonization as something which is built into India's nation building project. What did modern Indian art look on the eve of its independence? We've invited some leading scholars in the field to respond to some of these questions. Yashudra Dalmia looks at the semi-abstract formalism of the Bombay progressives, such as A.H. Ara, H.A. Gade, and so on, whereas Karen Zaitswitz deals with the exodus of Indian artists like F.M. Souza, S.H. Raza, Akbar Padamsi, to the West. As for the rise of the new institutions in the wake of partition, Atre Gupta underlines the role of Dilli Shilpi Chakra, while Rebecca Brown turns to the group 1890 and their new proposition for a modern and contemporary art. However, with the map redrawn, you know, around 1947 onwards, new states arose along the linguistic lines and identities. How does the regional make itself visible in art practice, especially in South India? So Ashrafi Bhagat and Rohini Ayangar, they write on this. Whereas Amrita Gupta Singh focuses on the Northeast, a region that was once ignored, but now it comes to the forefront. Conversely, Bengal, which was once an epicenter of modernism in colonial India, argues Nandini Ghosh, acquires a regional identity amidst the tumultuous 1970s and 80s, marked by the creation of Bangladesh and the rise of the Naxalite movement. Then we turn to post-colonial photography, and Rahab Alana tells us about his history, whereas Annapurna Garimela highlights the tension between classical, traditional, and the modern, which manifests itself in the way sculpture refashioned itself. And then I look at the return to the figurative around the 1970s in Baroda as a post-colonial and post-modern move with a wide ramification for contemporary art. Kavita Singh takes up post-colonial art institutions, especially the museums, while Sonal Kullar underlines the role of art writing in the story of modernism. The section finally concludes with Geeta Kapoor's critical meditation on the very category of national modern in the light of M.F. Hussain's departure from India which takes us to the new India of the 1990s and its own diverse practices. Welcome to part three of this book. Our story in part three of 20th century Indian art begins in the 1990s, which saw revolutionary changes in the country. In 1991, these included a series of economic reforms spearheaded by Manmohan Singh and then Prime Minister P.B. Narsan Rao after the death of Rajiv Gandhi that year. Liberalization, as it was known, would have tremendous meaning for the country. The easing of government restrictions during this period saw a rise in privatization and greater outside trade and investment. In the 1990s, this move towards globalization would have enduring impact on Indian citizens, leading to significant changes in the country, particularly in urban centers. Artists were also influenced by this transformation and reacted to it in their work, as our book details. Alongside these economic changes, momentous cultural and political shifts were also experienced. Among them, the demolition of the Babri Masjid in 1992 and the violence it sparked, which would lead to artist response through both art and activism. Technology continued to play a pivotal role in society. Cable channels appeared in India in the 1990s and later the 24 hour news channel. Computer use grew over time, as did the use of the internet from the mid-1990s onwards. 
Such developments would play a role in the evolution of video and new media art in the decades to follow. While painting, sculpture, photography, printmaking, and other forms of art continued to evolve in truly exciting ways from the time of independence, the 1990s saw a vitality and a greater intensification of new trends in art, such as installation and its role in the public sphere, performance, which foregrounded the body's political role, and new media, which continued to both critique and celebrate our growing dependence on technologies. At the same time, a sensitivity to the rights of minorities was taking shape. Women artists, Dalit artists, and folk and tribal artists also began to make their presence felt in the art world alongside a consciousness of the rights of these communities. During this period, art and activism continued to play a salient role, as did the ways in which artists thought about the intersection of activism and personal or shared practice. As such, collaborations and urban and rural community-based art practices demonstrated an ethical awareness towards shared creative, intellectual, and manual labor among participants. A greater recognition of the craftsperson was also demanded during this time as seen in this section. Environmental concerns remain at the forefront of the contemporary period and artists' attention towards greater responsibility to the earth and all its inhabitants has been witnessed. Finally, part three also takes into account the proliferation of worldwide biennials, triennials, and other reoccurring exhibition venues that drew artists from around the world together. Indian artists and those from the diaspora found themselves on the world stage with their impact felt across the globe. This is the time of the rise of the curator and a growth of alternate platforms such as Koj in India and its counterparts across South Asia, some of which are explored in part four of this book. Today we launch this book with a panel discussion. We will be joined by Partho Mittal, editor of the book, writer, art historian, and emeritus professor at, of art history at the University of Sussex, UK, who will be joining us virtually from Oxford. Parul Davi Mukherjee, editor of the book, art historian, and professor at the School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU. Naman Ahuja, contributor to the book, art historian, curator, and dean of School of Arts and Aesthetics, JNU. And Ranjit Hoskote, contributor to the book, poet, art critic, cultural theorist, and independent curator. I welcome you all to the session. I would now like to invite Sunaina Anand, director and publisher, Art Life, and all the panelists on stage to launch the book. Thank you. <laughs> there we go. 
anwählen. It's a massive enterprise, as you can see. It's a huge labor of love, and it's an extraordinary book that's been put together. And, um, you know, it's been produced to such a phenomenal standard. It's, as I look at it, I mean, apart from the fact that it weighs a ton, it's 745 pages long. And it's comprehensive in the sense that it has the entire 20th century covered in it, going all the way, not just containing itself to South Asia, to India, but looking at the broader South Asian region as it was before 1947. And you know, these are fundamental questions that the book actually raises as to what do we even consider Indian art and which India are we talking about? And when you're looking at the 20th century, that national boundary itself has changed. The kind of people it contains have changed speak louder. So the book has, is something which is quite extraordinary in its scope. And I've been amazed at what these editors have managed to do and how they've managed to put this entire book together. So I'm going to begin my uh, compliments, really, by asking uh, Parthada, who is with us from Oxford, and I don't know if he can hear me, um, yes, but it is, yeah, it is, yeah. I'm going to ask him really about what it was to be able to put together the entire early half of the 20th century, and how did the conceptualization of this project really take place? How did the editors decide what was going to be covered, and how did they divide the works to, the work amongst themselves? Thank you very much, Laman. Uh, it's great to be here. Can you all hear me clearly? Can you hear me? We need to check the volume level. Uh, okay. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, okay, you can hear me now. <clears throat> oh, all right. Uh, so, you know, um, when I started work many years ago, 1977, and all the whole, whole period from 77 to today, you know, there's been gradual decolonization of art history. There've been a lot of debates, a lot of uh, dis discussions, but one of the complaints, uh, by particularly by European art historians, yes, of course, a very interesting Indian art, but why should we look at modern Indian art? And also they said, there's no single, there's no really single volume there's no narrative. Where do I go for that? So I felt that this was very important. Uh, we needed to have a really a text, a handy text, which would give pretty comprehensive and wide-ranging information about modern Indian art. Now, it so happened that I met uh, Sudana Anandan Vimal, her husband, and they were really kind of very, very energetic, inspiring couple. And Sunanda said, asked me, Bhattada, we need a book on Indian art. So I said, okay, let's go for the whole thing. And um, also I said that it's a big project. I of course wouldn't be writing on my own. So I need uh, my team, people I could work with. And of course, Parul Dhabi came immediately to mind. Uh, superb art historian, and I've known her for many years. And then also we chose a very, very outstanding, sensitive uh, art historian, Rocky Balram. So the team started. Uh, there are a lot of um, problems, issues, the choice of authors, 
we want it to be very comprehensive, wide ranging, but that's a very difficult thing. So first of all, it was quite a complex uh, process of choosing authors, um, as well as, uh, of course, topics as well. But one thing we want to do was to try and be inclusive. Do you, you even know, know how many authors there are in the book? Uh, <laughs> Have you ever counted oh, them? <laughs> yes, it's, it's a very large number. Um, yes, indeed. Um, so, Laman, do, do you want to go ahead and ask me? Well, I mean, I think it's such a, I remember one of the early meetings in the formation of this book that happened in Oxford. And um, we'd all gone to Parthada's house and we were busy, uh, they were busy discussing the minutiae of the book. I had a very limited remit. I was sort of <laughs> there for entertainment value, I think. <laughs> and, it was great and, fun, you know, definitely great fun. We enjoyed doing the whole thing. And I must say, the whole team was wonderful all of us working together. So it was really a very positive and exciting project. Well, it's um, been a very long time in the making. It's been an extraordinary oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, There are always, you know, issues with such a big book. Yes, a long time. But, but we managed to get there. Yeah, but Parul, um, how long uh, has it been in the making? Yes. Well, it really started in uh, 2008 when this idea was proposed to us, in fact, by Vimal Anand, who's sitting right there in the first row, and over an informal conversation, he said, you know, there are so many exciting books which have come out from China, you know, history of contemporary Chinese art, uh, modern Chinese art, how come there's no such comprehensive volume for Indian art? And that's when we really started giving a serious thought, and we said, yes, indeed, it sounds like a great project. But when we started, uh, it was, basically Parthada and myself. And then we were thinking about it more in terms of a decade by decade narrative, you know? And, uh, and as we moved on, we realized that there is so much more to address. And that's when we realized that, you know, we really need somebody who can fill in for contemporary art. And Rocky Balram joined us at the right moment. And so three of us kind of made a team. And I would also call this book a kind of a really global art history project well several reasons one the fact that uh, all the three editors they were operating from three different continents three different time zones and had it not been for internet technology this collective project would not have seen the light of day and secondly uh, out of 46 contributors uh, 46, 46, 46, 46 chapters, authors that have come together for this yes. um, book, which I think in itself is something quite extraordinary because one didn't know that there were 40 plus specialists on modern and contemporary Indian art ex in existence, you know, and to be able to pull together so many people with a commanding um, voice and to have so many specialists actually come together, that in itself is saying something about how a field has matured and come into its into being. Sorry, so you were saying that apart from the yeah. number of authors. So uh, adding to my comment about why we look at this book as part of global art history is because out of those 46 uh, chapters, only 18 chapters are written by art historians who are based in India. The rest of them are from different parts of the world. So, and also, uh, it also gave us an idea that we are not restricted to the national boundaries. So the whole notion of nationalism really gets questioned in the process of writing this book. So have you actually worked out the, in terms of the contents of this book, mm -hmm. um, the scale of operations, like mm -hmm. how many mm -hmm. artists you've really dealt with in this mm -hmm. book? So I actually uh, did some homework and I worked you know, on the index, which is really stretching to so many pages. And to my own astonishment, I realized that the book contains thousand artists, not just from India, but from uh, the broader region of South Asia. And 
I did further analysis of the data and um, I was chastened by the fact that out of those thousand artists, only 200 were women, which tells you something about the unevenness of the field. Right. Right. Well, so that's a 20% representation. But the book still breaks a lot of barriers, like Parsada and you were saying earlier, that you've got areas that would not normally be considered because nowadays when people write about Indian art, they tend to restrict themselves to the modern nation state of India. And you've actually looked at the development of um, art in other countries in South Asia. And yes. then uh, I think the other thing that I was amazed at in this book is it's not just a study of these thousand artists, but it's about the processes by which these artists got their education mm -hmm. and how did they come to the fore mm -hmm. and what was the role of the institutions that backed them, mm -hmm. where they got their training. Mm -hmm. And those kind of stories and narratives that have come out alongside, mm -hmm. which I think is an important half of the story to let the world know as to what makes Indian art and what are the circumstances in which Indian art has emerged in the 20th century. That's right. So I must also um, qualify uh, what I have to say with the statement that you have to bear in mind that the history of 20th century Indian art was written in 21st century. And we, when we were writing it, all three editors, all three of us were convinced that in 21st century, you cannot restrict the geographical border to Indian nation state. And that's when we thought we have to have the third section that would bring in uh, modern and contemporary art in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Myanmar, and Pakistan to be able to give a fuller picture and shared history, which is very much part of modern and contemporary art in South Asia. Ranjit, I wonder what your views are on the book. And you're one of the contributors to the book. That's right. Yes. I have to say that it's been a, a very inspiring process just to see how it's evolved over more than a decade. And I would contextualize it in terms of the previous Thames and Hudson book on Indian art, which was uh, published years and years ago, I think when Nikos Tangos was still the edit editor. And it was put together by Balraj Khanna and Aziz Gurtha, who had a, um, let me find a gentle way of putting this, a sort of a connoisseurial, distant engagement with Indian art, which really partook of nostalgia and personal preference more than anything else. And to me, the big shift away from that kind of book and this is the movement away from a kind of omniscient, uh, editor who actually isn't all that omniscient to this kind of uh, uh, multi-editor, multi-author, far more embedded way of bringing these plural narratives together. So I think that is the outstanding achievement of this book. And it maps the way we really think about how knowledge is to be produced and distributed today. So to me, it marks this whole, if you will, a kind of a pedagogic revolution. It, invites us to think about the sources of authority in any, any field and how we really have to adopt far more collegial and collaborative approaches to, to this kind of uh, uh, venture. Uh, but also I do have a couple of questions about the title. And I mean, we all recognize it to be, recognize it to be a publisher's title, it's very clear. But it's precisely these kinds of questions. On the one hand, Parul, it's a generous and an inclusive gesture to open yourself out to other countries in South Asia. But this also is staged in the context of regional politics that are vexed and turbulent. So this, is the, this would be my question to you. To what extent would you address questions like that? Can we speak in terms of what elsewhere is clearly a Pakistani national account of their art or Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Nepal, wherever it might be. How would you negotiate those questions? So I think um, our take has been that, is it possible to include the history of modern and uh, contemporary art of Pakistan into this 
broader history of South Asia by focusing on shared histories, you know, because um, the fact that both Pakistan and India and Bangladesh, we all come from a colonial experience, which creates a certain kind of link across these nations. And also the very fact that our neighbors, which actually geographically speaking very close, they've had similar experience, but we have completely been shut out from their experience for something which we had to do something about. And that it's, it's a gap which we want to redress in this book. Yeah, I think, I mean, this, what Ranjit's saying about having these multiple authors, it, has, it, it doesn't give you this very digested prose with authorial command or a magisterial history that tells the student, this was how the 20th century happened. Instead, it's got these 40 authors, each writing their opinion and their interpretation and take on how they have seen that history mm -hmm. and what they have seen most relevant from that history and present it in their own voice, which does create a, a plurality in even the ways in which we view the 20th century's history. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is quite important given when we are writing contemporary history, when things are so close, mm -hmm. um, to be able to document and put these different opinions down mm -hmm. um, in a massive tome like this will itself become um, something quite historically important, I think, mm -hmm. um, in what it has achieved. So I think that's quite amazing. Yeah. But, you know, this is something that I wanted to ask you, Ranjit. I mean, as a curator, or for you, Parul, as an editor for a volume like this, this is constantly a dilemma that we confront. I mean, you have to put South Asia and India into a book, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, your chapter in this, in this book is, one of your chapters in this book is about the Venice Biennale and India being showcased in the Venice Biennale. Um, didn't you face a similar situation there? <laughs> Oops, <laughs> I did, yes, actually. But um, thank you for the question, Naman, because it really opens up this uh, debate about lacunae, illusions, what to bear witness to, what necessarily gets left out. But when I was invited to curate what was effectively the first uh, National Pavilion at the Venice Biennale, I felt I had multiple responsibilities. Uh, first, to the fact that India had actually had a presence mm -hmm. in Venice in numerous editions in the 50s and 60s, and later a couple of independent uh, collateral events. So I w didn't want those eclipsed histories to vanish. So I needed to bear witness to that in some way. But in terms of the choice of artists, I knew I was never going to be able to make it encyclopedic, and I didn't want it because it just becomes, in the format of a pavilion, it just becomes a large festival that cancels itself out in some ways. So instead, I foregrounded debates and problems. So I addressed myself to the question of what might constitute citizenship, who might belong, mm. and what might constitute the contemporary. Does that depend on their age, the form or medium that they choose? So, you know, provocatively enough, there was Zarina Hashmi, who was a printmaker in her 80s and a US citizen. There was uh, the Desire Machine Collective, which emerged from the Northeast of India, heavily militarized zone, yet making a cosmopolitan and emancipated statement. Pranit Soy, who worked between Kumartuli and Amsterdam. Gigi Scaria, who for me embodies a kind of internal migration from the deep south to Delhi. So, but these choices were made explicit. Mm. And I think my question also with regard to this, which is a very different kind of enterprise where necessarily a more encyclopedic, mm -hmm. then I, I, would, I would wonder what sorts of questions you wrestled with too, uh, Parul, Partha and Raki. Uh, how did you see this? And I know Naman and I have, have spoken of this uh, before. Uh, was it an encyclopedia? Was it more of a, an introductory primer, a reader? What sorts of... Uh, sort of genres or formats were you, were you mm -hmm. thinking of as this book took shape? Well, out of all the genres that you're mentioning, encyclopedia, primer, I think you also mentioned anthology, the one thing the book is not, I would like to state emphatically, 
it's not an encyclopedia. Because encyclopedia implies that you're uh, you know, holding a mirror to the world and anything which is in front of that mirror gets included. No, that's not the intention. We have very, very deliberately uh, selected artists, you know, artists who we think have played a historically significant role, you know, and who help us to tell the story of 20th century Indian art in a not linear, but multilinear way. So that is the criterion that we chose. And, you know, I think um, somebody like Dillers and Gattari have uh, given trees a bad name. I would reclaim that metaphor of a tree and compare it to a book because tree is something which is really expanding in both the direction, directions and a tree is always growing. It's, it's, it's like... Um, well, a banyan always is. Always and grows. So that's... A, <laughs> but I get your point. I think Parthada has been wanting to say something about this. Um, and yes. Uh, uh, first of all, Ranjit, uh, your uh, you know, point is absolutely... It's a very, very acute, um, you know, very penetrating comment. It's a very difficult question. How do you, when you're trying to uh, cover a very large subject, how, and, and also multicultural and um, vast sort of area, how, what do you do? It's never a perfect thing. And, uh, but what I wanted, we all wanted to do was to have different voices, multivocal. Uh, as well as to be as inclusive as possible. But I would say that we tried both to be inclusive, you know, I mean, if I may mention women, LGBTQ+, plus, um, subaltern, South India, the, the regions, they have not been given proper attention. Um, so these needed to be included. It's certainly not a primer, and certainly, as Barun says, not an encyclopedia. It's much more balanced between giving a broader as well as penetrating much deeper understanding of Indian the practice of art. And also another question, I mean, this is an interesting question about the title. It's a difficult question. First of all, publishers don't like South Asia. It becomes a kind of sociological text. So they always prefer India. But I do feel that we don't need to think in terms of Indian Republic and exclusively. We do share history of South Asia. So in that sense, I hope this will be taken in the spirit uh, it's been you know, offered. And my previous experience with my friends in Bangladesh and Pakistan, for instance, they have not objected, they have welcomed it, because I always thought that it shouldn't be just the present political uh, territory of India. So these are complex issues, but definitely multivocal. Uh, and yet there is an overall, I would say, shape to it and narrative. Yeah, I also want to respond to Ranjit's question that all the genres that you mentioned, you know, encyclopedia, primer, and so on, they are literary genres, you know, whereas our book, if you go by the way in which image and text is related, uh, they are, there are more than 800 images and 740 pages, which goes to show that uh, images are not subsidiary to text. So even if you just go through the book, keeping in mind the images, it has very interesting stories to tell. So images can stand on their own. So, so in that sense, I would say that this book really I think creates its own genre in that sense. No, absolutely. But also to make the point that uh, you're also drawing attention to the different sorts of debates and the emerging vocabularies through which this situation gets described. So, yeah, you're right. I mean, I don't know that we have a name for what this sort of, if you will, a kind of a compendium where it's going. But for me, it's a very positive feature of the book that it doesn't seek to place a singular paradigm on what it's looking well, at. Well, I think art publishing needs to be able to find its own paradigms and articulate them in, in general. I mean, I think um, it, because it is a genre on its own and it comes with its own compulsions and requirements. And this is quite an admirable thing. And I know about these kind of dilemmas in putting these books 
together and the kind of considerations that we have. Um, Can I ask a question to Naman? Yeah. So Naman, <laughs> uh, talking about exclusions, yes, uh, there are very systematic ways through which we have been able to redress these exclusions. One is um, the whole question of not just women artists, there are very few women artists in comparison, but we've also looked at intersection between women and region. So there are many regions which are excluded. So what happens when these two marginalities come together? And uh, we've also looked at performance art. Now, Ranjit would agree with me that as far as contemporary art is concerned, uh, we have largely catalogs to fall back upon, you know, or stray essays here and there. There's no pr proper comprehensive history of contemporary art. And within that, the genre of performance art. So these are the ways in which we've tried to address the gaps. And while we're writing it, we realized that one very important element which had been neglected was the relationship of craft with high art. And in a country which is so you know, unequal, how can we tell history of 20th century Indian art without bringing in craft as a very important trajectory? So Naman, since you have written a chapter on craft, would you like to tell us about the role of craft? Yeah, well, okay, now I get where this question was going and coming. I, yeah, I have a, a long-standing history in things that are made um, alongside, which don't get represented by galleries necessarily, which are a part of the living contemporary culture. They are as much affected by contempor contemporary contemporaneity and issues of modern politics as are the works of studio artists. These are people who are professional craftspeople and artisans and art makers, but they um, don't command the kind of prices that they do. They're linked with the agrarian economy and they, you, you wouldn't know how to position their work. You privatize them and put them into a gallery, you're doing a disservice to it and it's unethical. You <laughs> undervalue it and make it freely available and that's not celebrating the artist and you're stuck between these two stools because you want to give the industry recognition on the one hand you want it to be labeled as a part of the contemporary 20th century indian art scene and yet at the same time the hows of that and these questions were burning questions for a number of artists in the early 20th century like jamini roy who contended with this and then subsequently Devi Prasad, uh, who's worked with Gandhiji at his ashram in Sevagram and created the art school over there. And one of his students who happened to come there was Dashrat Patel, who went on to found the NID. And that takes us into how art and design are so closely linked because design is where art becomes a part of everyday life and becomes utilitarian. And so there is no separation between the world of craft, art, and design any longer. And then we come to other artists subsequently who um, uh, KG Subramaniam is another key artist and pedagogue in this regard. Haku Shah was another person who worked in this vein. And I thought that one needed to go back to not a history of modernism, but maybe a history of the arts and crafts movement to be able to see how the arts and crafts movement is brought back in India as a political voice, as an administrative strategy to be able to bring these worlds together. And I think India does have a remarkable history to tell in that regard. But again, I don't think I've done a very comprehensive job. I think I've brought out the, the difficulty in doing so. Right, exactly. Um, and I think much more can be done and needs to be done in this regard. Can we take some questions? Does, um, sure, we can see, we don't have much time, but um, if anyone in the audience has a question to ask, we can, we've got lots of questions. So um, can we ask this, the first hand here? Yes. Um, good afternoon. So um, while you uh, curated and edited the book, were there any revelations or moments where you felt that this particular thing could actually alter our fundamental understanding of modern Indian history or could completely change the course of it? Yeah, thank you for raising that very important question. So as I said, as we're writing, uh, we became aware of gaps in the current historiography 
and then we uh, try to redress them. For example, there's not enough work done on Dalit art. And within that category, women Dalit artists. So those avenues got sorted out. And then um, the other exclusions were, um, I think uh, of gender is something which is still, but still not very widely kind of addressed. And that is something which we have uh, been able to take on board. And uh, diaspora art. Now that was a very interesting category. Mm. A brilliant, I think, a chapter has been written by my co-editor Rakhi Balram and performance art. So these are areas uh, where you don't come across properly theorized writings. So these are the ways in which we've tried to address some of these shortcomings. Thank you. Is there another question? We have a minute um, over here. Can we pass the mic? I, let's ask two questions quickly and then we can try and do them one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, good afternoon, uh, all, all of you, please. Yeah, my question is like, uh, there are hardly any art museums in India yeah. uh, with paintings spanning art movements. Uh, something like Centre Pompidou in Paris or MoMA in New York. Yeah. So with this book as a starting point, do you think India can invest in something similar for South Asian art? Okay. What is the role of workshops like artists in residence in expanding the reach of South Asian art? Could you pass the mic Thank to the you. person behind you who's also been wanting to ask something? You've uh, got to be quick. Yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful session. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am, sir. Question. My question is that uh, after listening to your session, I really wanted to buy the book, but the book is priced somewhere around 8,000. Yes. So my question is, is the 20th century Indian art not really uh, marketed to an Indian audience? Well, given the, the questions, price? I think, I've, I'll, if, I, if I might, I think that's a... That's not a question that I should be fielding and I should be, I should be asking, passing this on to the publishers. And both questions about matters of dissemination and both questions are about public outreach and what do we do about public outreach in, in, in India? Um, can we have institutions that, and museums that can take on board the might and the uh, extraordinary achievement of a project like this and make it available to the public um, through mechanisms that don't have to cost as much as they do um, for this. So I think the point is well made by both of you about the requirement for both institutions and publishers to be able to make material like this accessible. Um, so I hope we have, I don't know if we have time. Can we take one last question, please? Yes, very short, sorry. One last question, it has to be very quick answer as well okay. okay so recently there was a petition by a government that national scholarship should be cancelled for students who are studying arts and yeah, history okay. and culture outside india uh, what is your stance on it as an artist and also i want to know how can one pursue art culture and history uh, in a globalized a world living when you're not allowed to go a short answer we, I at least deplore it. I deplore it's it too. sightedness of the government. And in uh, terms of the, my answer to the first question, you know, I think NGMA needs to open its eyes to contemporary art. It's a shame that in a country like ours, we still don't have a museum of contemporary Indian art. So if our book does that, it'll be a matter of great tribute. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Parul. Thank you, Sunena. Um, thank you, Vimal, for being there and arranging this. And thank you, Ranjit. Thank you. And thank you very much, Parsada. I'm sorry I couldn't see you. <laughs> <laughs> We'd like to thank our panel today, Partha Mitra, who joined us virtually, Parul Dave Mukherjee, Namana Huja, and Ranjit Hoskote for launching the book. And we hope you can grab a copy of it as soon as you can. Thank you, and we hope to see you at future sessions as well. <laughs>